what we do is crazy. Like, there's just no other way to say it. Uh, you know, we, you can't possibly expect people to go to a prison, which is an incredibly brutal experience for the lengths of time that we expect them to go to, and have them come out into a world where you can't get a job or housing or education if you're a felon, and expect anybody to make it. Again, there will be the rare person. There's Dwayne Betts, extraordinary individual, just got a Yale law degree and PhD from Yale and passed the Connecticut bar, but Connecticut won't let him practice law. Oh my God. Right? But, you know, that's like my gymnast, Kara Makar, doing the Protonova. Everybody else breaks their back. It's crazy. <laughs> Professor Allen is a classicist and a political theorist. She's written books on topics ranging from Plato and Prometheus to good citizenship and democracy. In her latest book, however, she's turned her attention to the US justice system, and most particularly to the plight of young black offenders behind bars. Her subject's a very personal one and deals with the events leading up to the untimely death of her young cousin, Michael, at the age of 29 on the streets of Los Angeles. Alan examines the deadly double helix of narcotics and street gangs which entrapped Michael, along with countless others, and eventually led to his incarceration and death. Alan asks, what could have been done differently, and does the current justice system merely perpetuate the injustices it is designed to address? I'm pleased to present Professor Daniel Allen. Thanks so much, Mary. It's a pleasure to be here. And thanks to all of you for coming out tonight. And I want to thank my kids and husband and Erica, our babysitter who helps out a lot as well, for being here tonight. That's really special for me. Um, I also want to apologize for, we picked Rosh Hashanah, the first night of Rosh Hashanah for this event. And so I apologize for not having um, realized that uh, in advance. So I want to wish a happy Rosh Hashanah to anybody who's watching, listening, and so forth um, as this evening. Um, this is a project that was born here at Harvard, actually, um, in more than one way. So I want to, since this is Cambridge, and so many of you are affiliated with Harvard, I want to start there and talking about the book. When I came to graduate school at Harvard, in 1996, it was just a couple of months after my baby cousin had been sentenced to 12 years and eight months in prison for an attempted carjacking on his first arrest. And this was a pretty devastating event, experience for our whole family. And I didn't tell anybody who was here with me about this. This is a story I told last spring at an event on campus. I didn't tell anybody, but it was a, it was a hard time. It was also, as it happens, a time when uh, Professor West was here on campus. He was teaching a course on W.E.B. Du Bois, which I really wanted to take. And I asked my department if I could take this as one of my political theory classes, Du Bois being one of the great political theorists of the American tradition. And I was told, no, couldn't take it as a theory class. So I kept pushing, and eventually I was able to take it for credit um, and to, to take that class with Professor West. But it's uh, nonetheless, I think, it was sort of symptomatic of life at the university at that time that it was very hard in some ways to put head and heart together. I needed to read Du Bois. I needed to think about African-American experience in America. And it didn't fit in terms of the agenda of what my department was offering. So as it happens, it was one of various pieces that led me to decide to leave Cambridge, leave Harvard that fall. So I completed my degree from a distance. I was only on campus I, for 18 months. I had a way to leave and was able to leave 18 months later. Um, and this moment in my cousin's life was a part of that, my own intellectual trajectory in this way that I've been able to understand looking back, but didn't know as deeply in the moment. And this all sort of came round again when uh, Skip Gates asked me to give the Du Bois lectures here at Harvard. He asked me some years ago, and I kept giving him these abstract titles for my lectures, like, I'm going to talk about political equality and African Americans in the 21st century. I'm going to talk about race and justice in the 21st century. And as I kept giving him these abstract titles, I also kept 
deferring and postponing the lecture, saying, ah, let's not do it this year, and so forth. And finally, we reached a point where, you know, Skip said, kid, you're going to have to give these lectures. Just face it. And as I faced that moment, I also realized I couldn't possibly pretend, in the spirit of Du Bois, to talk about the state of affairs for African Americans in the contemporary US without telling Michael's story. How could I pretend that these were abstract questions when they are questions of the most powerful and painful lived experience for me personally for so many, countless other people, millions of other people. So this is what I've tried to do, and in doing this, I've also just tried to give Michael's voice to the world. I'll say more about that in a minute. Um, but because there's so many voices and stories of people who have been trapped in the practices of imprisonment that we've had in this country for the last two decades that we just don't hear. And I just deeply believe that we need to let the stories rise to the surface so that we can actually see the world that we've built, that we as a society have built. So what exactly is Michael's story? I'll just give you a quick overview. I know a lot of you know it already, and I'm so grateful to all of my friends who are here tonight. So thank you so much for coming out and supporting this project. But Michael's story is that in 1995, at the age of 15, he was arrested on a first arrest, as I said, for an attempted carjacking. On his way to the hospital, so his victim got his gun and shot him, and on his way to the hospital, he confessed to also having robbed three people the previous day and another person a week earlier. So one has to be forthright and say this was a spree of violent activity. It also came out of nowhere. There was no history of behavior of this kind from Michael or for Michael, and as I said, it was a first arrest. But because it was California in 1995, and California had recently passed the three strikes year outlaw, and they had been routinely lowering the age at which somebody could be tried as an adult, a juvenile could be tried as an adult, Michael came to trial against that background, and he had two felony charges from the attempted carjacking, and people often don't realize you can get more than one felony in a single incident, so it was a whole sort of three strikes, you're out idea. It's like you can actually get all, you know, a bunch of strikes in one go. So he had a felony for having asked his victim for the watch and the wallet, and he had a felony for the car. Then he also had two felonies from the robberies he confessed to. The police had records for two, so they, they um, charged him with two. So he was told by the judge if he went to trial and was convicted on these four things he'd been, he'd confessed to, he would be facing 25 years to life on the basis of the three strikes, you're out, law. So he pled guilty and took uh, 13 years um, and ended up serving 11 of those years. So he got out when he was 26 and I was, as I say about it, sort of the cousin on duty when he got out. We spent a lot of time together during his years in prison on the phone, uh, with correspondence courses and things like that. There are lots of family members around trying to help at any rate. So I was there working the summer that he got out on the sort of pieces, sort of basic building blocks of life, college enrollment. I was just... <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Aww. Thank you. I so appreciate your being here and staying with us. I was just gonna say that, you know, Michael and I, the whole family, Michael was a firefighter, so he would have appreciated <laughs> this particular moment. We're working hard on his new life, and it ended three years after he was first released because he was killed by his girlfriend, the woman, transgender woman he'd met in prison during that 11-year stint. And Michael's story is one that our family, you know, there's this huge impact, but a terrible thing to say about it is, after he died, we never talked about what happened to him. So everybody has a tragedy in their family. Everybody has the problem of family secrets. And I wanna just say something about that because a lot of this story seems to be a story about family secrets, what it takes for people to break through shame about events of this kind in order to talk about them and find the truth. And we've got family secrets in my family, the big old extended family of Allens, 
but we also have family secrets in the country. And I'll come back around to that in a minute. But I want to just introduce you to Michael, let you hear his voice a little bit, um, and then I'll come back around to the secrets and the questions that had to be answered. So Michael is this beautiful, precocious, energetic, curious kid, loved to be outdoors, super talkative, motor mouth with a stammer. So you always felt as if he just had so much he was discovering about the world and wanted to share it, couldn't quite all get out fast enough. And he was the beloved youngest child, the son, third child of this big extended family's youngest daughter. So my dad had 11 brothers and sisters, and his baby sister Karen, the youngest of them, had three kids. And her three kids and my brother and I, we grew up together in Southern California. Very different circumstances. I grew up as a faculty brat. Karen and her kids grew up in the world of a struggling single mother, inching her way up, working incredibly hard, never enough time or money to quite pull things together, yet they were as a much part of the fabric of our extended family, had the resources of love and so forth of all of us. And the five of us spent a lot of time together as kids. We thought of ourselves as a single unit within this big extended family. So I just want to give you a little flavor of, uh, again, that sort of those early years. Karen inched her way up to a nursing degree. She got um, a little house for them in Highland Park outside of Pasadena, where they were for five years. And that was really um, you had five, five good years. Let me just read you a little bit about that. In Highland Park, the rites of passage proceeded according to plan. Michael's beautiful kindergarten teacher, the one with the blonde afro, loved him. He graduated in high style in a white cap and gown. He had gymnastics lessons and played Little League and went to summer camp. To raise the funds for camp, he sold peanuts, so successfully even that he funded his brothers' and sisters' trips to camp, too. The trio would go for three-week stints in the summer, then they would come home, their mother would do their laundry, and then she would send them off again. They always went together. Michael also had a glorious bicycle, a He-Man bike that he loved, and their house was on top of a hill. He would fly down it barefoot, not yet able to brake, ending up at least once with a swollen eye, with the bike all bent out of shape, having terrified his sister, cousins, mother, anyone who was around. His sister, who was growing into a large-bodied girl and had already developed a mothering instinct, would cry out, Michael, why don't you put no shoes on? We visited them often in this house. Once a month, from sixth to eighth grade, I would come by so Big Roz's girlfriend, my other aunt and her girlfriend, could relax my hair. The only slightly unusual ritual in Michael's life at the time was alatots. Since he couldn't have remembered his mother's drinking, his enrollment in the program must have seemed mysterious. Karen's spirit lightens when she talks about their time in Highland Park and how amusing it was to eavesdrop on the kids' Saturday morning alatot meetings. The trio would gather outside her bedroom door, whispering up a cloud of buzzing bees. They were whispering out their grievances, which, she presumed, were mainly about her. They were a united front, and in this small house, all four of them had five years they are glad to remember. So the title of the book, Cuz, just came to me, just out of the blue, one of those divine moments of inspiration, because that's what Mike could call me, he called me Cuz, because it means cousin, of course, but also because I realized what was killing me was the why questions. Why was he dead? Why had he been in prison for so long? And the hardest one of all, why had this beautiful, bright kid from his beloved kid in a huge extended family, why had he ended up on a street corner at the age of 15 trying to take someone's gun? And the book is an effort to answer all of those questions. And a part of the answer comes from what happened when his mother, when he was 10, his mother met a man who turned out to be abusive, and everything just exploded in their world. Everything came apart. They moved you know, five different schools in five years. They moved from California to Mississippi to Georgia, then back to California again. His school transitions were often mid-year transitions. And those were those years, 10 to 14. Just remember for yourself what it's like to be 10 to 14. It just sucks for everybody, regardless of the circumstances. And imagine the degree of difficulty that you add to that when your 
having those movements, the isolation, the disconnection from a world. Now, one of the terrible things about working on this book for me was that although we all could see the movement and we could see the disruption, it wasn't until I was working on this book that we learned that my aunt and my cousins had been abused. All right, so again, sort of back to the issue of shame and the way it keeps people from telling what's happening to them. And the result of that being those of us who care didn't see enough, didn't see enough to help. And that was our failing also, not to have pushed and asked the right questions to understand. But breaking through the silence is a key thing to avoiding, I think, these kinds of difficulties. So Michael's life exploded, and he ended up in South Central. Coming into South Central as a stranger in the early 90s, massive increase in gang homicides, violence in general, and the incredible ratcheting up of penal severity in Southern California. And this is a story about the war on drugs and how we fought it, the relationship between gangs and drugs, not anywhere nearly as self-evident as we take it to be. So in that time of the early 90s, researchers have been able to show that roughly half of the drug transactions in Los Angeles were connected to gangs. But police, when they were asked to estimate the number, would say 90 to 95 percent. And the result of those kinds of mistakes was that the war on drugs became a war on gangs. And I'll say more about that in, again in a minute. But the point is just that it was an incredibly dangerous environment. And when I was working on this book, I was talking to another cousin named Peely, who lived around the corner from where Michael landed. Peely lived in a Bloods neighborhood. And I said to Peely, you know, how is it, you know, you, you made it, you, were, you made it out in the context of a great degree of difficulty here, he's a professional in Los Angeles, like, what's, what was the difference between your experience and Michael's experience? And his answer was, this was a world in which if you came up in one neighborhood, you just were understood to be a part of that group, the Bloods, the Denver Lane Bloods in his case. You didn't have to do anything to prove your loyalty, so you could skirt around the edges of that world and stay safe. But if you landed there as a stranger, and didn't have any affiliations, you were obliged to declare your affiliations to prove yourself. And Michael landed there late 13, and over the course of 18 months began to flirt with both Bloods and Crips, which is this incredibly dangerous thing to do. And again, little pieces of information, but nobody in our family put the story together. And so, for example, it turns out there's a third meaning of cuz which, again, I didn't, I didn't know until I was working on this book. Some of you will know. Cuz is also what members of the Crips call each other. So Peely, who grew up in the Bloods neighborhood, had heard Michael starting to call him Cuz, and it gave him chills. It was very upsetting to me. I thought, how could Michael call me this? He knows where I live. But Peely never shared that piece of information. And so although Michael was flirting with gangs at the end of this time, again, none of us saw this. His mother didn't know this until I was doing this work on this book and put all of the pieces together. Okay, so now, Michael, as I said, he was a bright kid. He wanted to go to college. He spent a lot of time in prison doing college work. I wanted just to give you a little more of his voice, read you a part of his essay about Dante's Inferno. And like Dante, I am forced to descend lower into hell to achieve a full awakening. I am forced into depression scarred by obscenities, war after war. But each war that I survive, I am a step closer to a full awakening of self. My hell is no longer demonstrating what I am capable of doing in order to survive. It has become what I can tolerate and withstand in order to live. I cannot help but to judge those around me. I am one of them, but we are far from the same. Like Dante, I am cursed with the spirit of discernment which allows us to see the truth for what it is. There are most whom I despise who are truly sick beyond healing, and they should never leave this place. Then there are those who await to fulfill their destiny. I see in them a sincere and apologetic heart for their ill misdeeds. They are the ones who will change the world positively or positively change someone's world. Hell cannot hold the latter of the two opposites, but in time will only spit them back out into society to do what is right. The hell that I live in cannot hold Dante. Hell can test and try oneself, but it cannot hold Dante, and it will not hold me. In the inferno, the dead are trapped forever. Surely the biggest and most important difference 
in the inferno and my hell called prison is that I have a way out. Now, I wanted you to hear Michael's voice, not actually because his voice is special necessarily, it's special to me and to my family, but this, voices like this is what our prisons are full of. And this is where I want to switch from talking about the family secrets and the problem of shame that blocked my family from seeing what was going on to the bigger problem of the family secret that we share as a society. Okay? So, yes, Michael's choices, bad choices on that street corner put him in prison. And our family's failure to care for him in a coordinated way with full knowledge about what was happening to him put him in prison. But so too did the world that we as a society have built with our criminal justice system. And I want to talk about that family secret to try to flesh this out the rest of the way. So, you know, I don't actually have to tell you, you, you all here are well aware of our family secret. It's got a couple of different parts. The first is, the world has never seen a penal system like the one we've built in this country. Like, I can say that because I'm a classicist, <laughs> and I have studied punishment in antiquity, and I take the long view and the world view of the question. So the penal system that we've built, where this country has 5% of the world's population and 25% of the people in prison, is completely a made in America special. Okay, well that, the news is getting out, but it has been a family secret for too long. And it has been a family secret as it has been building. But the other part of the family secret is the relationship between that fact and the war on drugs. Which is, again, I know people sitting here generally know, but I still think it's worth spelling out. Okay, because Oftentimes, when you are asked about mass incarceration, and people say, well, what are the drivers of mass incarceration? And some say, well, the war on drugs. And people say, well, let's get, release all the nonviolent drug offenders from prison. The result of doing that would be that about 14% of people would be released. And so people turn to, to, to me and say, well, look, you know, so ending the war on drugs won't make that much of a difference. It's just 14% of people who would be released. I'm like, well, I'll take 14%. <laughs> Plus, you know, I'll take that. I'm not going to complain about that. But let's think about it for a minute. If we think about it, we realize that the war on drugs has had a lot of other effects, too. So I always like to stop and ask, who knows how much money Americans spend out of pocket every year on illegal drugs? Anybody know? Now, that's a family secret if we don't know. A hundred billion. A hundred billion dollars a year, every year for the last decade. All right? That's a hundred billion dollars worth of desire that we have in this country that we don't admit to, okay? That with our legal system, we pretend it's not there. Now, that's an awful lot of material, a big economy, and of course, an illegal economy of that scale generates a lot of violence. So you have a lot of violence associated with the war on drugs, which also puts people in prison. But then there's other pieces of this. So in 2013, just take one small statistic, 32% of new filings in federal courts were drug-related filings. Okay, now what does that mean? That means prosecutorial workloads are swollen by dealing with drug cases. And when prosecutors' workloads are swollen in that way, they don't actually have the time to devote to cases that aren't open and shut in, say, the homicide category. That's the anecdotal account on the part of police. And when they don't deal with cases in that category, you get a reduction in homicide clearance rates. So in the middle of the 20th century, homicide clearance rates across the country were about 90%. That means cases closed for homicide. They've come down to 50%, 60%. In Detroit, before its bankruptcy, it was in the teens. Okay? Now, the point of this, so there are some economists who've explained what's going on with violence and in urban areas and contexts like that. And one, one of the points they make is that when those clearance rates come down, it's not just that there's a sort of 
world of retribution or lawlessness, but there's a whole phase shift in violence. And the reason there's a phase shift is because if you know somebody can attack you and go unpunished, your best defense is a strong offense. And all the levels of violence shift upwards. So that's another chunk of the activity that gets captured in the criminal justice system. But then there's a few other things too. Let's not forget that once you decide that somebody should be locked up for a year for simple possession of marijuana, or for somewhere between a year and five years for simple possession of crack and cocaine or heroin or whatever, every other sentence is going to have to shift longer to maintain any sense of proportionality between violent crimes and nonviolent crimes, which means you're going to have a kid on a first arrest for an attempted carjacking where the only person who got hurt was himself, being presented with the possibility of 25 years to life. Okay? So there's a corruption that has come in from the war on drugs. And then the last little turn of the screw here that I want to put out there is, so the state wants to fight the distribution of drugs, and it does this by targeting its incredible power on the distributors, the low-level street distributors of narcotics. Well, what is the result of that? Well, the folks who are running this $100 billion business don't want to lose control of their distributors, so they're going to themselves counteract the efforts of the state with their own systems of deterrence, structures of sanctions and penalties in the world of gangs and drug delivery. And the result is, huge increase of violence, as there's, in effect, a war between the state and the parastate, I argue, okay? And when you've got this going on, you've got kids in cities exposed to huge amounts of violence in all kinds of contexts who need protection. They need protection. And what do gangs offer? They offer protection. So boom, the state hits the parastate, boom, the parastate hits back, and who suffers? The kids. The kids. And it's because of our collective family secret that we're not telling the truth about the world that we're building. I also like to use the idea of degree of difficulty to talk about this issue of how do we put individual responsibility and social responsibility in relationship to each other. So I was particularly struck by this last summer watching the Olympics. I don't know who else watches the Olympics. But there was this gymnast from India, I think Karamakar was her name, and she was doing this maneuver on the vault called the, I think it's the Pradranova, but I'm probably getting that wrong. And I, you guys clearly don't have the same obsession with gymnastics as I do. <laughs> but this is this maneuver, which is it's the highest degree of difficulty in gymnastics. And it's the kind of degree of difficulty where you either make it or you break your back. Right? That's it. Like the whole coverage was like, is she going to break her back? Is she going to break her back? Is she going to break her back? Like that was what the news coverage was about. So she made it. Great. Okay, yes, people can make it in circumstances that have the highest degree of difficulty. But the fact of the matter is that one person makes it and most people break their backs. And the issue of the degree of difficulty that a young kid faces, that's where our responsibility kicks in. We as society, we, with our laws, with our institutional structures, have established a world with very disparate degrees of difficulty facing kids. That's one of the messages I'm trying to share by sharing Michael's story. So I want to just give you one last example, I suppose, of the way in which the problems of shame block honesty about what we've built with prisons and the experience of them. So I'm going to just read you a teeny little bit more. I know I'm taking more time than I should probably, Mary. I apologize. Just a little bit more. Um, a chapter called Visiting 1.0, which my editor didn't like. Okay, so some of you guys heard this already, when I, the Du Bois lectures. People thought it was okay then, but my editor didn't like it. But it's still here in the book, you'll notice. Okay, so I'll just read a little bit. As Michael, known to the system as K1033, wrote, inmates went by numbers, not names, and visiting days were allocated to sets of numbers. Half of the evens on one Saturday, half of the odds on Sunday. 
the other halves of each set the following week. Before you could even begin to visit, you first had to apply for permission to enter. You had to get your name on the list. This could take months. And then the visits themselves were odysseys. We generally set out at about four or five in the morning, in the half dark of pre-dawn, and drove straight toward the rising sun in order to get to the prison by 6.30 a.m. There we would join the line of waiting cars snaking from the parking lot past a row of suburban baseball fields that bordered the prison. This was a good time for heart-to-hearts between Karen and me. At 7.30 a.m., the guards would let a parade of Kias and Hyundais, Chevys and Dodges into the parking lot. And then you would sign in at a lectern at the front of a canopied structure with wooden benches that looked something like a tent revival meeting. Hosts of mainly black and brown women, but white women too, and many children, and some men, flitted in the shadows under the canopy. We could take in up to $30 in quarters or singles in plastic baggies, and we always took the maximum. The point of this was to purchase treats for the inmates from the row of vending machines dispensing, as it turned out, quite disgusting microwavable cheeseburgers and burritos, along with mystery meat plates. It also mattered how you dressed. You couldn't wear blue denim because that's what the inmates wore. You couldn't wear beige or khaki because that's what the guards wore. You couldn't wear tight clothes or clothes that showed cleavage or skirts shorter than two inches above the knee or sleeves shorter than two inches below the shoulder. If you were dressed wrong, you weren't let in. You always took a backup set of clothes just in case. If there was a focal point of the control, I suppose it was the attempt to target desire. All right, so my editor kept, he kept going round and round and round to this chapter. He kept saying, but you don't tell us about you and your experience. I'm like, what do you mean? I kept saying, all this detail, like the $30 in singles, and you know, I, I'm giving all kinds of texture, things I saw and observed. And he kept coming back to this point. And if you were listening, you probably heard it. So all the way through the book, I say I. I talk about my experience. In that chapter, I said you. Did you hear it? Did you notice? And I realized, when it suddenly light bulb went off, that even this far into writing the book, been through several drafts already, this far into it, I couldn't talk about what going to prison meant to me at a personal level. So I had to write another chapter, Visiting 2.0, right? Time for my own confession. I wrote that last chapter like an academic, which I am. The description of visiting that I gave you wasn't about me, it was about some disembodied you. To write that chapter, I stepped into the perspective of an outside observer, the luxury afforded to academics when they travel the world encountering pain and injustice. To be an academic is to acquire an excuse for not owning the pain you see. Abstraction, distancing, those are my first tools of self-protection. Athena's spear and shield. I will have to try again to describe what visiting Michael meant to me. The fact that I told the story as an academic already tells you everything you need to know. That wound of visiting Michael in prison goes so deep that somehow, Even in writing this book, I have found it hard to own up to one simple fact. I went to prison. I was in prison. No, I don't mean that I have been arrested or convicted of a crime. I have avoided that because thus far in life, I have had that combination of goods that the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle thought was necessary for a happy life. Resources, decent character, and luck. My father and mother gave me the first two items from that treasure chest, the Lord my God, whom I believed in as a child and then did not believe in and then came to believe in again as I emerged from periods of great pain, has given me the third. All right, so now you know more about me than anybody other than my husband. (laughs) My second husband, that is. (laughs) Our wedding took place barely a month before Michael's murder. But no, I was not in prison as a convict, and this is thanks to my father, my mother, and my God. Yet even as someone who could come and go, I felt the prison's mark, its branding fork. I felt it in my soul, even though all I was there was a day's sojourner. Thank you. Um, before we open up to questions, I just wanted to ask Danielle a few myself from the book. Um, 
first of all, it, it's very fascinating, but it's very disturbing. The, the, and particularly when Michael's words are used. The, the words, the, the one that really affected me was the one that was in the New Yorker article. Um, he said, we who are in prison had to answer for our sins and our lives were taken from us. Our bodies became the property of the state of California. We are reduced to numbers and stripped of our identities. I'm not Michael Alexander Allen, but I'm K10033. My number is my name. Dante was not in hell due to a fatal sin, but somewhere in his life he strayed onto the path of error and away from his true self. I, K10033, strayed away from my true self, Michael Alexander Allen. So Michael talks about his own descent, as he, as he calls it. And you mentioned that his family environment was abusive and broken and unstable, and he ends up in Inglewood in Los Angeles about 13, and he's in a class which is full of violent kids and they have weapons. How much of a germinator for young offenders is actually the early environment? Well, I mean, I guess what I was trying to describe is there are a lot of different things that produce the degrees of difficulty that a kid faces. So without any question, Michael's frequent moves, the exposure to violence and so forth, yes, those things put him on a path to need protection. I think that's the sort of point I'm trying to make, I think, is that, you know, kids, again, think back to when you're 14, 15, you're dealing with the question of what's your relationship to your own family, you have stirrings of romantic desire, you have a desire for mobility, to get out, to do things, to make something of yourself, and the question of whether that's well supported or not definitely depends on whether there's fragmentation in family life and so forth. I mean, so, so yes, we can make that experience that's always hard for every kid either harder or a exploratory space that helps them lift off and succeed. And Michael didn't have that second thing. He had the version that made it harder without any question. But Again, so I mean, when I was do working on this, I was doing research in the sociological literature about how kids get involved in gangs. And the basic pattern that sort of scholars seem to agree on is that kids flirt with gangs in the ages of sort of 10, 11, 12-ish, and then about 18 months after they start flirting with gangs, they have their first arrest. And that pattern fits Michael to a T. And so I guess part of what I'm trying to say is that it's not that the kid as a person becomes an offender. It's not a change in the person of the kid at that stage. It's rather that in that world, that environment of danger, they're trying to figure out how to navigate it, and they accept offers of protection that come from an environment that also has all kinds of temptations in it. Um, and then they're in prison, and then they have an education in being an offender. Okay, the logistics of Michael's particular case is he was in California when he committed the offense, and at that time you had to be paroled to the actual area, the county in which you committed the offense. Yeah. So that was sending him back to exactly the wrong environment. Uh, is that still yeah. the case? Yeah, no, that was, um, so as I understand it, I mean, California has been walking away from some of the excesses in its penal system in the last few years. So they have mod moderated the three strikes law through a ballot initiative. And my understanding is that the parole requirement has also been moderated at this point. But yes, I mean, one of the hardest things about Michael's situation was, so he was doing college courses. You could hear from his Dante essay, he was doing well. He was also a firefighter in California's inmate wildfire fighting units, and that was incredibly good for him. He had this, you know, really flourished when he had a combination of intense outdoor activity alongside the intellectual activity. He needed both of those things in relationship to each other. And so we had developed plans. You know, we had, he was going to move to Chicago, live with my family, go to college in Chicago was one plan, and another plan was we had family in Riverside County, which was where his last prison was, where there were firefighting programs. And he was going to move in with them and join one of the fire camps and, and move forward in that. 
and about six months before he was going to be released, I mean, this is, it's, this is embarrassing to admit that we didn't understand these things sooner, but six months before he was going to be released, we learned that he could not be paroled to one of these other places, that he had to be paroled back to Los Angeles County. So we scrambled to make an alternative plan, and that's where you know, there was a fire technology program at Los Angeles Valley Community College and so forth. But yes, there was an absolute prohibition at that time against paroling outside of the county where your offense had been committed, which is, and you can understand why it's like worries about litigation risk and things like that if one county's parolee goes to another county and commits another crime or something like that, right? But it's crazy from the point of view of helping people establish mm. a new foundation for a new life. The other um, weak uh, link in the chain seemed to be that the education that he was so desperate to have uh, was not easy to come by. Even though you enrolled him in Indiana University, he could only have books that were soft, that had courses right. that had soft covers. Yeah, so I have this um, favorite Ralph Ellison essay called uh, Initiation Rights or something like that. I can't remember, I'm gonna forget the title of it. But it's this great essay because it talks about fool's errands. It's like you think you've been given a serious task and you run around as hard as you can doing it and it's really just a way to like, make you feel like a fool. And so that's sort of like what it's like trying to get an education in prison because there's so many rules that you have to work your way through. So yes, yeah, so Michael enrolled in, there, you know, there were no college courses. California had stripped college courses out of the prisons as a part of making prison a deterrent, not a rehabilitative project. And Pell Grants had been removed by the federal government and so forth. So we did manage to get him enrolled in Indiana University. We were feeling very excited about it. And he was like going through the course catalog and you know, all that sort of freshman semester feeling, picking out his courses. And he, we send off for the courses. And then we learn that he's only allowed to have uh, soft cover books. Uh, you can't have any hardcover books. So I have to like, go back to the course catalog and like, call every instructor and be like, OK, you know, does you, what's your, what are your books? Are they hardcover, softcover, et cetera, which left two classes by the time I was done that were viable possibilities, a philosophy class and an English class. So yes, I mean, there's so much to be said about what has happened to our criminal justice system, but our, the failure to see education as a necessary part of helping people complete their sentences and have a second chance is just, it's, it's a huge injustice. So my last question, uh, obviously the texts that, that are in the book and the fact he was studying the Odyssey and Dante's Inferno, I mean, he obviously, this guy had a hunger to grow. It was clear that he wanted to grow. How did this nice little cousin that you mm -hmm. talk about in the beginning of the book end up being this person who's referred to as Big Mike, who's quite seriously... Right. So threatening. Michael went back to prison about a year after he got out. Uh, and he went back to prison, so this is, so let me back up and talk a bit about the text he read. So this is my, one of my favorite parts of working on this book. So Michael wrote all these essays. He wrote this essay about Chaucer, about the Knight's Tale and the Miller's Tale, which are two tales about desire. And I remember, you know, working with him on this essay, like, okay, very good, but a great point about Chaucer, you know, a great point about this passage in the Knight's Tale and so forth, you know, really great piece of academic writing. And when I went back working on this book and reread the essay, I realized, he was telling me in that essay the story of falling in love. It's an essay about desire, and he wrote it at exactly the point that in prison he fell in love with a woman whom I call Brie in the book. I changed her name in the book. Okay. Well, it wasn't really about Chaucer. He has these great lines about, you never know what will happen to a man because of the unpredictability of his desires. I was like, he was, he was just talking to me. He was just sharing his story, and I, I didn't hear it. <laughs> didn't hear it. He told me he'd fallen in love, so I knew that he was in love, and this gave him great contentment in prison, and it was a beautiful thing to hear in his voice, a relieving and beautiful thing. But anyway, as it happens, the reason this is relevant is because a year after he got out, he, got, he had reconnected with his girlfriend, and he got in a fight with another one of her lovers, and so that sent him back to prison on a parole violation. And that second trip broke his spirit. And when he came out, which was just nine months, uh, roughly speaking, before he finally died, um, he went straight into a world of criminal associations connected to his girlfriend. Um, and that was the period in his life, sort of last nine months of his life, that he became somebody known as Big Mike, somebody with a street life, et cetera. And there was a real sort of separation between 
that world that he lived in and the world that he also joined with his family. So he was able to go back and forth between the two worlds. And so I think one of the perhaps eeriest passages of the book is Michael had two funerals. He sort of had to have two funerals. His mother had to have a funeral at her church, and then there was a sort of street funeral at the church that he'd been going to. And that kind of captures where his life had gotten to in that last year. Okay, if anyone would like to come up to the microphone and ask Daniel some questions, please feel free. So to, to what do you attribute the um, sort of the strange relationship with Bree? And um, at other points in his life, did he have more traditional relationships with folks? Well, so again, this is when I, I do in the book, kind of like ask people to just remember what it's like to be 15. Just think about what it's like to be 15. Now imagine you're in prison for 11 years. You're gonna fall in love. I think that's all the answer that one needs. So, I mean, he was 15. He hadn't had any relationships before he went to prison. He came of age as a man with sexual passions in prison, and that's his story. Thank you, appreciate your question. What I see as one of the biggest problems that this Hollywood system has created is they trashed the great black jazz culture and pushed people to do gangster rap and wreck black culture. I am livid. I don't know why this isn't more. We had great black musicians, good jazz musicians. There won't be any more Onet Coleman's. Oh, I would never more, say there'd be no there more, won't be more Coleman's, Mc McCoy Tyners. Another one I have to say, so this is my, one of my confessions. I have joined one fan club in my entire life, and that is the Ornette Coleman fan club. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm sure there will be more Ornettes in one fashion or another, even if they don't sound like Ornette Coleman. I have no doubt about that. And I'll just, um, I, you know, I don't think music is the problem. Okay, I think the problems are about our laws. And this is, I'm not, um, you know, I don't, I don't, there's lots of music I don't listen to, there's lots of music I wouldn't want my kids to listen to, so I'm not saying that I think all music is great, but I do not think music is the problem, and I think rap has been a way for people to express powerful criticisms of the institutions they've experienced. So I personally take a more nuanced view on the question. And it does go beyond that. If you're black and you're busted with marijuana, you go to jail. If you're white, I saw them pour it down the drain. You know, this is yeah. commonplace. Yep. Well, this is what I meant about family secrets. So, you know, basic family secret. Drug use is equal opportunity. Everybody participates. Drug sales are also equal opportunity. Everybody participates. The rule of thumb is that people buy drugs from people who look like them. But that is not how we punish it. Michael wrote about feeling like himself and some of the other people in the institution didn't seem to deserve of a second chance. Do you believe uh, efforts should focus on allowing for more second chances and making people who were incarcerated uh, have better second chances or preventing this mass youth incarceration in the first place, which is more detrimental on youth like Michael? So I'm sort of an all of the above. <laughs> kind of person. So without any doubt, we need to reform our prison system and restore a rehabilitative um, orientation. Now, that's not an easy thing to do, and it doesn't mean that there aren't hard cases that will sort of challenge that boundary of where we think rehabilitation can, can be viable, but I think it's critical that we do that. I'll come back to that in a second. But because people do, I've been talking about my book in a lot of different places, and people, I think, find it strange. I tell this story about Michael, and I, I didn't say, you know, Michael didn't use drugs, okay? He didn't even sell drugs until like the last few months of his life. Yet, I make this huge argument about the war on drugs, okay? People find that very strange. They think, you know, I should, I should just be talking about juvenile justice. I do need to talk about juvenile justice, but I believe that the world that trapped Michael, we have built with the war on drugs. And so I do think that we have to dismantle that through legalization of marijuana and decriminalization of harder drugs, 
It's an important distinction. Misdemeanor, not a felony for harder drugs. Take the resources that we use to target low-level distribution, target high-level traffickers. There's a lot more that can be said about that. Portugal has tried it with good results. Uh, I believe that that's actually the fundamental thing, to just bring down the experience of incarceration. And then, yes, like when we've like gotten the experience of incarceration to some sort of reasonable point, that too should be a real rehabilitative space and a restorative justice space, one that's about healing communities, not about applying you know, sort of massive levels of power uh, that are directed at kind of like aggregate numbers of crimes to specific individuals without regard for their own circumstances. It's like mandatory minimums, for example, are another example of a problem. Good evening. Um, thank you for sharing your time. Thank you. Um, thank you for listening, truly. Um, my question, I was kind of urged by some colleagues to come up here and ask a question, so I haven't really thought through this. But um, <laughs> uh, So I guess I have a linguistic question um, and how to pivot this discussion from justice-oriented to punishment oriented or, or, or distinguish between the two rather. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the times we call it the criminal, criminal justice system, but there's nothing just about it. Um, it's a criminal punishment system. And similarly, um, the distinguishment between order and peace. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering if you could kind of distinguish sort of where, where you think that we can go to sort of push the, the language of the discussion in order so we can address some of the nuanced um, positions that we have within the discussion, um, whether that's prison abolishment or more community-based things. Um, how do we kind of sort out the language so that we're actually saying something that has some substance instead of just using labels? Well, that is a very big question, so thank you. Um, so I, there's one argument I make that runs a little bit against the grain of how people are talking about these issues these days. So we talk a lot about the end of rehabilitation in our penal system. And we then often say that what replaced it was a retributive system, a sort of vindictive system. And I actually don't think that's right. Retribution is about proportionality. Just desserts. Right? Whereas deterrence is about like slam the thing as hard as you can so like it never happens again and we don't actually care about the details of the specific case. So I actually argue kind of paradoxically that like A, we need to cover, recover the concept of retribution. So judges can get, we can get rid of mandatory minimums and let judges actually fit the consequence to the wrongdoing, have reasonable sentences in that regard. But that's just sort of a part of it. I think for me, the other vocabulary that's really valuable is the vocabulary of restorative justice. So if you accept there, there's a basic, you know, the basic notion of sort of retribution helps bring a concept of fairness back into the conversation, actually. But then there's a more important thing, which is that, you know, crimes cause anger, victims have suffered, their suffering needs to be acknowledged also. And a way of thinking about this is to think of the need to restore a community, to restore the victim, but to restore the whole community to heal relations. And that's about bringing the wrongdoer into that process of restorative justice, as it's called. So Australia has been doing a lot in this regard. And to some extent, it does involve alternatives to prison, so forms of community service. Um, forms of rebuilding of things that have been broken or destroyed, mediation, et cetera. So there's sort of a long list of specific practices that can support a restorative effort. Um, and yes, I do think that is a valuable thing to try to introduce to our conversation here. I guess I have two questions, and one of them may be too big for you to tackle tonight, um, and that is the question of race. and the role that the, the success of the civil rights movement might have had in the pushing the nation toward a more punitive system of criminal justice with penalties, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the second question relates to everything that you and your family did for your cousin as he was getting ready to be released many, many people come out of prison without that kind of support. And when they come out of prison into a punitive system, 
that doesn't yeah. allow them jobs, that doesn't allow them a vote, and they don't have support, the recidivism rate is very high. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that whole picture and how your family felt about it and dealt with it. So, I mean, I think the, again, I said, you know, the, our prison system is a made in America special. As my grandmother used to say, you know, ain't never been seen before, this one, you know. Um, and that is the result of a perfect storm, I think. So, yes, it's about race and racial power and domination in this country. Um, it's also about uh, the way in which, um, you know, the... Nixon started the war on drugs and started it by um, disrupting the French connection, which was the mafia transport route to bring heroin into the U.S. from uh, Middle East through Europe and through Canada. And that opened up an economic opportunity for cartels in South America and to some extent Southeast Asia. And when that, that happened simultaneously to the increase of militarization and violence in South America and Central America, and that brought sort of weapons into the business in a different kind of way, you know, that whole thing wasn't in a strict sense about race, but it's a part of, you know, sort of the deadly double helix of what we created. So there are a lot of different things. And there are you know, bipartisan efforts to increase levels of punishment. And as you know, recent scholars have also argued, black communities also arguing for increased policing, harsher sentences, and things like that. So it's really a perfect storm of causes generating this penal system the world's never seen before. So I'm sorry, I think I lost track of your second question. <laughs> I apologize. Recidivism. Yeah, no, I mean, it's just sort of like, um, what we do is crazy. Like, there's just no other way to say it. Uh, you know, we, you can't possibly expect people to go to a prison, which is an incredibly brutal experience for the lengths of time that we expect them to go to, and have them come out into a world where you can't get a job or housing or education if you're a felon, and expect anybody to make it. Again, there will be the rare person. There's Dwayne Betts, extraordinary individual, just got a Yale law degree and PhD from Yale and passed the Connecticut bar, but Connecticut won't let him practice law. Oh my God. Right? But, you know, that's like my gymnast, Kara Makar, doing the Protonova. Everybody else breaks their back. It's crazy. It does sound crazy, but I wonder. Um, and I'm wondering if you can bring these ideas together somewhat more explicitly with something that I know you've thought and written a lot about, um, trust and trustworthiness. And thinking about these kids who need protection from somewhere and where they're likely to feel enough trust to turn to to get it and where they're not. And thinking about the massive untrustworthiness of this system that stigmatizes, incarcerates, mistreats people in these ways, and wondering whether a world of white and wealthy power is so massively untrustworthy with these horrible results. Is it crazy or is there some horrible function being served by having the world in which people don't go to prison in the first place or manage to build a life after they've gone to prison? Shutting those doors by, by making that whole system so profoundly untrustworthy? So, in all honesty, um, I, I would want to say I think it's more complicated than that. Um, again, I think race is definitely a part of it, um, a hugely important part. I would not want to disregard that. But I think we can risk uh, not seeing other things that matter by a sole focus on the question of race. So let me just give you two things. Um, so one of the most, so like, again, like, whew, it's an incredible thing 
to go back and try to understand what happened to somebody that you love. And to just see these little moments that tell you everything that you missed or didn't understand at the time. And one of those for me that's in the book is when Michael's arrested, uh, his mother wants to get him out on bail. And he says no. He says no. That he would be worse off going back to the streets than staying in prison. Okay? I just want you to like, take in the magnitude of that choice. And it's not like he didn't know that prison was a bad place. And this was before he was sentenced. He didn't know he was going to be there for 11 years. But, and that, like, it was a little, it's a teeny little moment where, like, he said, I don't want to be part of that world I've started to be part of. I actually want out of it. And nobody saw him say that. Right? Like, the judges didn't register this choice he just expressed, a revealed preference, as our friends the economists would say. He got, he got nothing for that. Okay, so, so he, he didn't, it wasn't actually a sort of trustworthiness problem altogether. He, 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 his trust proved, you know, false, like it was unjustified, so there is that. But there was that connection to possibility if somebody had been ready to see and hear. So it's the seeing, failure to see, the failure to hear, that's my concern, and I don't want us to miss that by assuming from the get-go that people aren't trustworthy, all right? And then the second thing I would put alongside that is, again, like this, I told you, so Portugal has experimented with legalization and decriminalization, and one of the details that's most interesting about what's happened there is that adolescent drug use is down. Nobody expects that with that policy change. Now, why might that be? I don't know the answer to that, but it strikes me that, again, you know, we have this massive family secret about drugs, okay? Adolescents already don't like to talk to their parents. It's a heck of a lot worse when the thing that you might need to talk about is illegal, right? So I think that we've just built a culture of hypocrisy and secrecy and deception for our entire society. And again, like, that's not about race. We've got to see that and be honest about it, I believe, as a part of addressing this issue. So I was wondering, given the rate of return back to jail and the fact that the system is somewhat set up against the person that comes out of jail because, you know, you have to declare that you're a felon if you apply for an apartment and everything else you mentioned, um, there's a lot of culture of fear that you might be the one that lets the offender come back in and the offender you know, commits a crime again. How do you change that culture that affects universities, you know, and everybody yeah. that has to, that gets to provide a service that could let this person advance past their past? You know, I just think about the two women, the landladies uh, that Michael and I interviewed with and when we were seeking his apartment. And he went in there and he told his story and they said, yeah, they'd give him a chance and they would rent to him. And I figure if they can manage that act of grace, so can the rest of us. So I think we have to find our examples and teach through those examples. I want to bring up something that really hasn't been talked about. And that is, besides the war on drugs, there's been essentially the war on mental health. Yeah. That has led to essentially, instead of taking care of our mental health people, the prisons are the ones who are taking care of them. Yeah. And obviously, they don't do a very good job. Yeah. So I think these things are completely connected to each other, right? Because a lot of people are using narcotics as modes of self-medication. And... Um, you know, I think the fact that we don't treat drug use as a health problem um, is continuous with our failure to do right by mental health. So and add that to my list. I gave like, this long list of the ways in which the war on drugs has corrupted our culture, and I would add that one to the list, the fact that we don't treat mental health and, and, and drug addiction generally, drug use generally, as health issues. And so in part of what I'm trying to do is help us shift from thinking about issues of drugs as a criminal justice issue to being a health issue and put mental health issues in with that as well as part of the conversation. Absolutely. 
Reading your, well, you said that everyone has a tragedy in their family. And when yeah. I read your New Yorker article, it was, it gave me courage because it made me think, oh, maybe I could write about mine, uh, seeing that example. And uh, as another academic, I find myself struggling with the thought of writing about something so personal mm -hmm. and that's so revealing not only of myself, but of many other people's uh, mm -hmm. private lives and uh, the struggles that they've faced. And so I was wondering if you could speak to that aspect of writing this book, uh, both the struggles that you face with yourself shifting to writing about a personal topic that instead of about Athens. Uh, right. And yeah, also, know. <laughs> you know, about uh, how your family members felt about you writing this, this book to the world about their very private experiences, such as, you know, Karen's experience with abuse. Right. Well, I have to say, I started by asking Karen, Michael's mother, asked, asked her for permission. So I wouldn't have done this without her permission. But the truth is, you know, Michael was this really talented writer, and we'd always hoped he would tell his own story. So part of the loss of his death was the loss of his telling his own story. And we all felt that. So Karen was grateful for the idea that his story, his voice, would, he would have his way out. So, and I asked his brother and sister for permission as well. And beyond that, I did not ask for permission. <laughs> Uh, and so there's mixed feelings and further uh, reaches of the family about airing dirty laundry and things like that. Um, but Karen and Rosalind and Nicholas all said yes and gave me so much of their time. And we talked together and wept together. And um, I said, you know, again, it's like, it's embarrassing to admit in public, Michael died in 2009 and it wasn't until I was working on this book that as a family, we talked about what happened to him. Just terrible. Families need to talk about these things and understand the pieces. So I was honored. My aunt Karen joined me at a book festival in Decatur to talk about the book. So I think of her as a co-author. We've definitely worked on this together. And um, she calls it a liberation and a peace-giving thing. So I know that California has amended their requirements regarding voting rights for felons in the last several years, so I'm not entirely certain as to what they were at the time, but I was just curious as to if you ever had the opportunity uh, to speak with Michael about those restrictions and what that meant to him. Well, you know, I'll just read you one little last passage. I won't directly answer your question. I mean, at the time, um, voting rights were just totally off the table. And um, I have to admit, I have mixed feelings on that subject in the sense that one of the reasons it's so obviously necessary is just because the system is so big, okay? Like, it's sort of the paradox of, it's precisely because we imprison so many people that we need to change this. And again, I'm not saying that we shouldn't change it even for a smaller system, but it's sort of like, sometimes I get a little frustrated with um, the sense that things, the focus of reform efforts, when the focus of reform should be about getting the system down to a, you know, a minimal size. Um, but anyway, but sorry, that I'm digressing. Um, because obviously, given where we are, that's an incredibly important thing. So let me just, I just want to read. A little bit more from Visiting 2.0, and then we can close with that, if that's okay. Um, so this is just back to my being in prison with Michael. Um, let's just, okay. Uh, I'm sorry, if you don't mind, I'll, I won't take too long. I, and I'll let you all go. <laughs> okay. So this is, I was there as a day sojourner, I just said. What exactly did I feel? The women were gloriously flamboyant in their dress. Not me, I'm a bookworm and more or less dressed dress like one. A lot of black, now and then some bright color. But for these prison trips, I probably pretty much always wore all black. Black t-shirts, black linen pants, tennis shoes. You have to do something to lift your spirit up when you go into the prisons. I didn't do it with clothes, I did it with conversation. I understand the show, the color, the makeup. But I wasn't there to visit a boyfriend. I was there to visit an Allen one proud member of a proud family, come to see another, both of us trying to pretend we had not been broken. We talked about ideas, about books and people, about freedom and politics. To explain why I was there in that prison, I could try to say that Allens have a fierce bond, 
and that we stick by our own. This would be right and wrong at the same time. The right part about that story has to do with our all being sprung from J.P. Allen, North Floridian island fisherman turned Baptist preacher, patriarchal head of a sprawling family, half of it official, half of it enjoyed in secret. For this reason, J.P.'s progeny extended to a cousinage that adds up to an uncountable number. Yet there is surely not a one of us from either the official or the secret branch who does not have in our soul the sights and sounds of tall, bald, lean, and leonine J.P. thundering from a church pulpit and gorgeous gospel baritone, he's a battle axe. In the time of battle, he's a battle axe. Time of battle, he's a shelter in the time of storm. We are fighters, we Allens, and sometimes we fight with each other. That's where the idea that Allens just stick together breaks down. The whole tribe is full of its broken branches. But for those who haven't fallen into fights, the bond is adamantine. My father and his sister, Michael's mother, have had that permanent bond. We Allens are also an upright people. The Allens have incredible posture, and this is not an accident. We are free people. We have been free a long time, even if one of our forefathers was also briefly enslaved through deceit and trickery. When I went to visit my cousin in prison, I did not feel like a free person. The reason for this is very simple. In that prison, even as only a sojourner, I was not a free person. Thank you.